Welcome to Ted's Health Club. If you're new to the channel, I try and explain why I chose to give up animal products and talk about some of the benefits that I've seen and other people that I know have seen from cutting animal products out of our diet. And once a month, I give a talk and show some of the food that I eat. Uh, the first Wednesday of every month, uh, I call it uh, Ted's Potluck uh, Dinner because I'm hoping that on the first Wednesday of every month, everyone will make a plant-based meal, whole food plant-based meal, and join me in, and watch uh, my video that I'm making, my podcast, to help people to find and see the benefits of eating plant-based. And I hope that once you do that, that you'll invite someone else over to watch it or tell someone else about it, forward it to other people to kind of spread the, the information about the benefits of eating whole food plant-based. So one of the first questions, of course, that I always get is, you know, where do you get your protein from? And, you know, if you look at the animal kingdom and you look at all the animals, some of the largest mammals on the earth don't eat any meat and gorillas for example uh, don't eat any meat or very little and uh, they're one of the most one of the strongest animals per pound on the planet and uh, cows don't eat meat um, elephants don't eat meat so you don't need meat to get your protein and if you ask that question about where do vegans or plant-based people get their protein, then you don't know beans. In other words, you need to research beans because there's a lot of protein in greens and beans, even potatoes and rice. But today uh, I'm gonna show you what I eat because that's the next question that I get. Well, what do you eat? So I'm gonna kind of talk about how I start my day out. Uh, I have a green smoothie, and what I do is I juice um, cucumbers and celery, and then I add in also some uh, wheatgrass, and that's all I drink in the morning until 11.30 or 12. So I'm doing kind of a modified um, intermittent fasting program. Uh, there's no carbohydrates in, in this green drink, so it doesn't uh, force my body to produce any insulin. So I'm giving my body an 18 hour window. If I stop eating at six or seven, and I don't eat until 11 or 12 the next day, it's you know approximately an 18 hour window where my body doesn't have to produce insulin. So it gets a break and it makes my body more insulin sensitive. Uh, one of the things that I talk about on this channel is that my diet is 80% carbs, 10% fat, and 10% protein. I've lost 60 pounds. I've never been hungry. I've never counted a calorie. And so when people ask me, what do you eat? Well, there's a lot of things that you have to choose from. And you discover more as you cut out meat, you discover more. And as, especially as you cut out dairy, and you find the benefits and the reasons of cutting out dairy and meat, you find all these other options to, uh, uh, to eat. So I start off my day with the green drink and then around, you know, whenever I get hungry, 11 or 12, sometimes it's one o'clock, then I'll have overnight oats and I'm gonna talk to you about how I prepare my overnight oats. Uh, on other days, I'll have a salad. On other days, I'll have uh, my potatoes that uh, that I did a video on, uh, how I bake my sweet potatoes and my uh, golden yellow potatoes. Um, other days I'll have a hummus wrap, um, uh, vegetable soup. So there's there's just so many options, and uh, the the menu for today. If you look on our uh, website, we have the menu for today. Ted'sHealthClub.com or on my Facebook uh, page, Ted's Health Club, uh, you'll see that we have a sweet potato uh, recipe that anyone would love. 
So I hope you will try that. So I start off with, uh, for my overnight oats, I start off with um, steel cut oats, and then I mix in some uh, chia seeds, and I blend my chia seeds in the blender uh, so that it's ground chia seeds, it just, your body's able to absorb it easier. Sometimes the, the seeds are, are harder if they're not uh, chewed up. Uh, then I add in some hemp hearts and some ground flaxseed, and that's the, the base of my uh, overnight oats. Now, people you know, will ask, why, why don't you cook your overnight oats? Well, I soak them in oat milk, uh, almond milk, you know, any kind of plant-based milk overnight. And by the next morning, they're, they're ready to eat. I mean, all you have to do is add fruit to them and it's ready to go. And one of the reasons that you don't cook oats is because they naturally have, uh, of course, fiber and, and that doesn't hurt to cook, but the, it has resistant starch in it, uh, oats do. And the, the two things that your microbiome want, which is your good bacteria in your gut, the two things that it wants is fiber and resistant starch. And so there's a lot of resistant starch in oats until you cook it. With potatoes and other starches, it increases the resistant starch by cooking and cooling but with oats, it actually preserves the resistant starch to not cook it. So I soak it overnight in uh, some kind of plant milk. Uh, I make my own plant milk and I make it out of the same ingredients that I use in my overnight oats. And you might think it's funny why I have uh, my sugar here. It's actually not sugar. It's actually in my overnight oat mix. I take all these and put it in here and then all I have to do is put a couple of scoops, uh, tablespoons into my milk maker and out comes plant-based milk. Uh, I'll put these items in there and I'll also put in maybe a couple pecans, a couple walnuts, a couple almonds and I, so I make my own plant-based milk. Uh, some people uh, may think this is a little too thick, so you may want to strain it in a strainer. You can also just put these same ingredients in a blender and run it through a strainer, and there's your plant-based milk. So uh, the reason that I make my own milk is because the uh, milk that you get from uh, the stores uh, have, um, you know, it's processed, it uh, probably has some preservatives in it, uh, probably has some emulsifiers in it uh, to keep the milk mixed up. And so those emulsifiers that they put in those are hard on your gut. Uh, it can be one of the contributing causes toward leaky gut syndrome. So I, I try and stay away from uh, emulsifiers if I can. Uh, if I don't have time to make my own milk, I'll buy oat milk at the store or almond milk at the store. Uh, so I'm not saying that uh, I don't recommend it. I just think that this, I, I know, you know, what's in this and it's all just natural. So I'd, I'd rather make my own if I have time. Okay, so then I have uh, two bowls, you'll see, of overnight oats. This is mine because I take it with me with a, a top on it. Uh, after I add the fruit to it and take it with me to work and that's what I'll eat for lunch uh, today and then I'll throw some berries on here for Brenda uh, strawberries blackberries raspberries other days I'll slice apples and put uh, Cylon cinnamon in it and Cylon cinnamon I don't know if you're aware that the cinnamon you buy in the grocery store you should go to a health food store and ask them I want the healthy cinnamon and they'll know what you mean and what, what you're asking for really is the Cylon cinnamon but if you forget the word Cylon then at least you can go to the health food store and say I want the healthy cinnamon and they'll know exactly what you're talking about. Okay so 
that kind of encompasses my breakfast and lunch. And then there's all kinds of things you can do for dinners uh, that are plant-based. And I've got recipes on my website, tedshealthclub.com. Uh, I've got educational videos on my website. I've got previous uh, potluck talks that I've given. And I hope that you go check it out. Uh, right now, we're going to hear from a few doctors on some of the benefits of eating plant-based. Enjoy. Why is it that being plant-based is better for us? Because I'm sure that you, like me, when you were uh, in school, you were taught that human beings are omnivores, meaning that we are supposed to be eating a mixture of animal and plant foods. And if that's true, then why is it that eliminating part of what we're supposed to be eating is better for us? Well, it's because like Humphrey Bogart in Casablanca, we've been misinformed. Uh, we are not omnivores. We are by design and physiology and even our psychology strict plant eaters and that's what I hope to prove to you today. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started and I'll start you off with a quote of mine. People have been so thoroughly brainwashed that they actually think eating pieces of dead, rotting corpses is somehow healthy. It's just crazy. It's a corpse, ladies and gentlemen. It may not be in a casket, but it's a corpse. So, so why is this topic important? It's important because experts estimate that up to 80% of the major disease and premature death that we see in Western countries every year could be prevented by making major changes in our diet and lifestyle. And again, just think about that for a moment, 80%. If I were to ask to, for a show of hands, which I really can't see because the lights are in my eyes, but if I were to ask you to raise your hands if you know of someone who's had a heart attack or had cancer or has diabetes or who has died from these diseases, I'm willing to bet every single hand in this room would go up. And I'm sure uh, many of you, like me, have lost loved ones before their time to these dreadful diseases. Well, if you think that 80% of those people or 80% of the suffering that they've endured could have been avoided, that is just a really sobering statistic. And so we need to understand that Yes, being plant-based will help us avoid these things, but we also need to understand why. And it's also important to understand why because it puts greater impetus and a, a greater moral underpinning on the need to change our diets. Now, we've been told we need to change our diets for our health. Uh, Brenda mentioned how important it is to save the earth. Lots of people are talking to you about the, uh, um, the impact of animal-based agriculture on uh, climate change and global warming. It is the number one driver of climate change and global warming. Just start out talking about the gut microbiome. And this is really interesting. Um, a lot of studies have looked at the effect of the diet on the gut microbiome, but few studies on diet of any type have included vegans as an experimental group. First of all, there aren't that many vegans. And the second thing is the definition of vegan is so varied that it's hard to quantify. But some recent studies have looked at the effects of vegan versus even just plant-based or um, let alone omnivorous diets on overall health and the gut microbiome and shown that vegans have a gut microbiome distinctly different from non-vegans in several ways. Now, I happen to be vegan, so anything that lets me know I'm special, including my gut, makes me happy. All right, these include, these um, differences include a reduced number of pathogenic bacteria, higher counts of beneficial bacteria, and, uh, and many other things I'll chat about here. So in a recent study, researchers looked at bacteria, inflammation, and health status. And then how do differing diets impact those three things? 
So um, the whole study was like 40 pages long and lots of references. I'm just going to cover some highlights here, and then you can go back and read the original if you want to. But they cited one study in which Slovenian vegans were shown to have more of a particular type of bacteria that I'm not even going to try to pronounce on this broadcast here, which is very um, effective and, and highly productive at producing butyrate and other short-chain fatty acids such as acetate and propionate. These fatty acids perform many functions. They act as signaling molecules to reduce inflammatory responses. The gut bacteria that produce these fatty acids prefer fiber as a nutrient. And uh, obviously vegans eat a lot of fiber. Omnivores, not quite so much. So it's not surprising that we would have higher counts of these particular bacteria that produce these short chain fatty acids that address inflammation. And it just goes to show you what a magnificent machine our bodies are. Like we have all kinds of natural ways to address things. You know, a lot of people take um, aspirin every day or a leave or Tylenol for inflammation. My body is just handling it on its own. Nice to know, right? Other studies reviewed showed that the fecal samples from vegans had a lower pH than controls which was correlated with lower populations of pathogenic bacteria like E. coli and enterobacteria. Apparently, our pathogenic bacteria don't like that more acidic environment, and those of us who eat optimal diets have much more acidic guts, so we keep the bad guys from overgrowing. The authors reviewed studies looking at the connection between vegan diets, gut bacteria, and inflammation, concluded that vegan diets had a positive effect of, on inflammation-related diseases. Of course, we've seen that with people who have inflammation-related diseases like allergies, asthma, and autoimmune diseases. In one study, patients with rheumatoid arthritis were randomly assigned to eat a raw vegan diet or an omnivorous diet. At the end of one month, there were positive changes in the fecal flora of the vegan group and none in the omnivorous group. The vegans also showed decreases in disease activity, which led the authors to conclude that the diet induced changes in fecal flora and led to improved health. The authors note that other studies have shown that vegans have lower risk of obesity, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, autoimmune and cardiovascular disease, and that the diet includes more nutrients, phytonutrients, and antioxidants, and fewer foods known to cause allergic responses like dairy. Um, the researchers concluded, and I love this, said the vegan gut prof profile appears to be unique in several characteristics, including a reduced abundance of what they call pathobionts, or pathogenic bacteria, greater abundance of protective species. Vegans also appear to lack the intestinal microbiota for converting dietary L-carnitine, which is in a lot of animal foods, to the pro-atherosclerotic TMAO. And that TMAO leads to atherosclerosis. Um, so people who eat a lot of animal foods are at higher risk. Reduced levels of inflammation may be the key feature linking the vegan diet, gut microbiota with protective health benefits. So um, you don't really even have to be vegan. I mean, I'm vegan and I love it, but as many of you know, I don't teach a vegan diet here for everybody. If you can just get the animal consumption down to three times a week, organic or wild caught, no dairy. Um, you can have a gut microbiome kind of close to mine. Of course, if you want mine, you gotta be vegan. If you want one that's, that's that good, right? Okay, so now I'm going to talk about diet, weight loss, inflammation, knee pain. And this issue of knee pain is so common that um, I felt compelled to chat about it a little bit. One of the most common musculoskeletal complaints is knee. Uh, it's so common that we do hundreds of thousands, over a million uh, knee operations in the U.S. every year. Most of them worthless. One study in the New England Journal of Medicine said that every year, we do 700,000 arthroscopic knee surgeries that we shouldn't be doing. 700,000 useless ones. Costs us over $4 billion a year. Well, the surgeries don't work, but I'll tell you some things that do. This will shock you. Diet, exercise, weight loss. What you expect me to say, right? To maximize the protective components in the diet, the fiber, the phytochemicals and antioxidants, the pre and probiotics. We'll just go through these really quickly. Fiber, how much is recommended? Well, 38 grams a day for men, 25 for women. How much do we actually get? Well, most people, about 15 to 17 grams a day. Vegans, 35 to 40 for women and 45 to 60 for men. Anybody hazard to get, well, I'm telling you here, but how much people ate in Paleolithic times? 70 to 150 plus grams a day. That was what people got back then. And so what is optimal? Well, probably optimal is at least 40 grams a day. 
to, you know, 40 to 80 grams a day, somewhere in there. And certainly vegans are at an advantage because all plant foods contain fiber, all whole plant foods. Um, so how much? Well, you get 10 to 20 grams in a cup of beans or lentils. You get lentils are about 16, um, uh, navy beans are about 19, just for example. Uh, avocados, about 13.5 in one avocado. That's amazing to me. I uh, would have never thought they were a really rich uh, source, and that's not including the skin, by the way. You don't have to eat that. And grains, about 5 to 10 in a cup. Berries, about 3 to 8. And then fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds, other than berries, would be in the 2 to 5 range per serving. And, of course, only plant foods contain fiber. Um, the low fiber foods are the refined carbohydrate foods, fast foods, highly processed foods, and the no fiber foods are meat, poultry, fish, dairy, uh, and of course oils and sugars. Uh, so we want at least 12 to 20 grams of fiber per meal from a variety of whole plant sources. Uh, phytochemicals and antioxidants, we just need to be uh, maximizing these in our diets because they afford powerful protection against disease. Phytochemicals, these are plant chemicals and antioxidants, literally put a lid on inflammation and oxidative stress. So we need them in our diet. And one of the things I should mention here is, is that if you take antioxidants or phytochemicals and you package them in a pill form, they don't do the same thing as they do when they come from food. And as a matter of fact, their intake in that form could backfire, as it has in some studies. Do you remember in 1980s, they found people with high levels of beta carotene had low levels of lung cancer? So they did several studies giving beta carotene to people with, with, uh, who were at risk for lung cancer, smokers. And what they found is the people who took the beta carotene ended up with more cancer, not less. And so you'd go, why? How could that be? Well, it could be because when you eat carotenoids from foods, you're eating 50 or 60 different kinds of carotenoids, not just one. And it may be that a variety of those carotenoids are needed, to, are needed in order to work synergistically to provide the protection. And when you load your body up with just beta carotene, maybe you actually prevent the absorption of some of those others because your body thinks it's got enough carotenoids. So we don't know for sure, but it's always better to be getting those, those you know, protective uh, antioxidants and phytochemicals from whole foods. And we know these compounds can help to reduce our risk of disease. So how do we maximize intake? Well, to start with, we want to think variety. So instead of always having the same grain, or instead of always having the nut, same nut or seed or the same vegetable, Mix it up because each one provides something a little different. And so the whole works. It's not just fruits and vegetables that provide these antioxidants and phytochemicals. It's all of the plant foods. We want to think color. So the richest sources are often the most colorful. So instead of white onions, choose purple onions. Instead of, you know, um, brown rice, choose black or red rice. Instead of you know, white beans choose red or purple beans or whatever, and you, you get the idea. But generally, even with lettuces, you want deeper green rather than lighter green. You always want to go for color when you can. So if you're buying quinoa, if you could buy the red or black, it just gives more antioxidants. And, and certainly, you, it doesn't mean you can't eat the, you know, the beige or the white colored grains. They're fine too. But just mix it up so you have a variety of colors in your repertoire. So, and with uh, vegetables and fruits, you want to eat the whole rainbow. I would say at least three green, two orange, yellow, two red, pink, one purple, blue, and one white, beige every day. And, and so when you make a salad, one of the the little goals you can have for yourself is to see if you can reflect the whole rainbow in your salad. And even try to include things that have unusual colors, like watermelon radishes uh, that are this unique fuchsia pink. You know, try to get that mix of all sorts of different colors. 
increase your intake of raw foods. And the reason we talked about plant enzymes, but some plant enzymes help you to convert the phytochemicals in foods into their active forms, what we call bioactive metabolites. And so, for example, there's myrosinase in cruciferous vegetables that helps to convert glucosinolates into isothiocyanates. And isothiocyanates, like so, are things like sulforaphane, for example, are potent inducers of phase two enzyme systems that help to convert um, inactive, um, actually help to convert toxic compounds into water-soluble compounds so you can get excrete them from the body. So very, very um, uh, important function. If you cook your broccoli, you kill the myrosinates and you get less conversion. Okay, so having some of these, these cruciferous vegetables raw is helpful. And it's the same with the allium vegetable. Um, there's a, uh, an enzyme called alanase that helps to convert alan to allicin, which again is the active form. So having some raw in a salad dressing or, or even chopping it and letting it sit for 10 or 15 minutes before you throw it in your soup, you'll get more of the conversion happening. And then you want to add sprouts. I saw some wonderful um, uh, sprouts over here and uh, just unbelievably amazing foods because what happens when you sprout a food is you're sending a message to the seed that it's time to let the phytochemical army explode because the phytochemicals are what, help, what, what protects the plant. And so when that little seed has to protect the plant, it's got to multiply its army of protection. So in some cases, like in, in uh, broccoli sprouts, the sulforaphane content is 52 to 100 times higher than it is in mature broccoli. In a lot of grains, it's, you know, it increases 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 percent when you sprout. Not only that, but when you're telling a seed to grow, you do a couple things. You reduce anti-nutrients and you release the stored forms of nutrients so that the plant has the nutrients it needs to grow. So it's wonderful transformation in this plant when you sprout. More phytochemicals, less anti-nutrients. So it's all good. Um, and then you want to pile on the herbs and spices. And this is something that we need to think more about. It, 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 I think herbs and spices should be a food group in of themselves. And, and certainly we think about um, uh, the, the colorful herbs and spices, the reds and the, the golden colors like in turmeric. And these are some of the most potent uh, anti-inflammatory compounds known to mankind. They're just incredib incredibly powerful. And uh, we need to use them. In, in your breakfast, you can add you know, cloves and nutmeg and cinnamon and all of these kinds, or you can do a savory breakfast and include, um, you know, a wide variety. But at every meal, think about adding herbs and spices. And then we've got plant-based probiotics and prebiotics. Probiotics are the microorganisms in food that take up residence in our gut and help to support a healthy gut flora. And, and um, if, the, you know, if, if our gut flora is healthy, we reduce inflammation, of course. And prebiotics are the food for that flora. So that's what they would eat to keep themselves healthy. And so there are a number of things we can do to shift our gut flora from unhealthy to healthy. We can eat a plant-based diet rich in, in prebiotics. So prebiotics, where are they? Well, beans are a wonderful source. Uh, Jerusalem artichokes, bananas, onions, and you know all of the plant foods are sources of these indigestible um, uh, uh, fibers that feed our gut bacteria. We want to eat food-based probiotics, such as yogurts like almond yogurt or coconut yogurt or any of these kinds of fermented foods, fermented vegetables, sauerkraut, tempeh, miso, all of these uh, probiotic-rich foods. We want to minimize our intake of uh, refined carbohydrates, processed foods, meat, fried foods that can damage our gut microbiota. 
take probiotics if you're taking antibiotics, and minimize alcohol, which are quite, is, is quite um, harmful to your gut microbiome. I hope you enjoyed those videos. I hope they've brought you perhaps one step closer to cutting animal products out of your life, for your health, for the planet, and for the animals. Join us the first Wednesday of every month for our potluck. You've got to try this.